Good morning and welcome to the Portable Noise Monitor Placement Meeting. Um, I call the meeting to order. The San Francisco, San Francisco Airport Roundtable Community Portable, and I'm saying that out of turn there. Um, first, I'd like to introduce uh, staff that are present. Kathleen Wentworth, the Roundtable Coordinator. Angela Montes, the Roundtable Administrative Secretary. And Bert Benham, the San Francisco Roundtable Care for Noise Office. Um, at this time, um, Ms. Wilburn, if you could call, if you could call for minutes. Uh, I'll call the roll as Chair Cecilia Taylor. Present. Member Terry O'Connell. Present. Member Christine Bowles. Ms. Bowles indicated she had fun for the day and would not attend. Um, I, if I could also, Madam Chair, uh, that we have present via Zoom, uh, Tim Middleton, who's the HMMH Technical Consultant to the Roundtable. And um, we also have Linda Woolman, Senior Legislator Day to Supervisor Dave Pine. And Angela, can you help me out with your list if there's anyone else? Okay, great. Yes. Members of the public will hear from later. Thank you, Ms. Wentworth. Um, at this time, we will now move on to public comment for items that are not on the agenda. Staff will note any written comments which have been received and will allow members of the public to speak on items not on the agenda. Ms. Montes, will you advise the members of the public on how the meeting will proceed? For those attending in person, there are speaker slips. Please fill one out and indicate which agenda item you're speaking on or whether you're commenting on items not on the agenda. You can hand the speaker slip to me and when your name is called, you will have two minutes to speak. For those attending the meeting on Zoom video conference, we will use the raise hand feature in order to organize any public comments. During the general public comment period and for each item on the agenda, I will ask those members of the public who wish to comment to click the raise hand feature to speak on that item. And if you're calling by phone, you can press star nine to indicate your desire to speak. And Madam Chair, I do have one virtual hand raised on Zoom by Darlene Yapley. Ms. Yapley, give me one second. Go ahead. Good morning. The FAA and the AICA, which is the Aviation Impacted Communities Alliance, had a two-hour webinar on July 13th regarding the FAA's noise policy. The AICA represents 70 grassroots groups. At the webinar, the FAA stated that they analyzed census and recent noise data for noise exposure levels down to DNL 50 around the 30 largest airports in the United States. This is significant because it means data is available down to 50 DNL when typically the data is only available for DNL 65. SFO is a top 30 airport. Your residents would be interested in knowing their DNL, especially for areas that do not have monitoring. I suggest the roundtable ask their community engagement officer for the DNL 50 information performed for the San Francisco airport. The meeting notes uh, on the webinar are posted on the AICA website. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Yapley. And with that, Madam Chair, we have no further hand raised for items not on the agenda. Thank you, Ms. Montes. And thank you for the public comment. Um, now we will review an update of the prior portable noise monitor placement ad hoc subcommittee meetings. And I believe that was the attachment to the agenda. Um, there are uh, two attachments, Madam Chair, to the agenda. One was a 2017 memo from uh, the Airport Noise Office, and one was a May 26th, 2020 memo from, um, excuse me, from Terry O'Connell, chair, then chair of the Portable Noise Committee. Um, and the second document is um, significant because this is the document that she presented to the uh, airport front table committee as a whole. It, I believe it was the June 2020 meeting for approved and, and was approved at that time. Thank you for that update. So, Ms. Wentworth, and do we need to approve the last meeting minutes? Okay. 
I will move on and I'd like to welcome everyone to the portable noise monitoring um, subcommittee meeting. And I appreciate the attachment and then also the recent map that Mr. Ganong put together to show where all of our noise monitors are located. Um, I will move forward with the only item on our agenda um, so that we can have a proposed discussion. And now I would like to find out if any members of the public have a public comment. Ms. Marcus? Thank you, Madam Chair. For item one, we have nobody wishing to speak in the room and there are no virtual hands raised on. Thank you. So since there is no members of the public that have a comment, um, do any members of the subcommittee have a comment? No comments. Thank you. The next item on the agenda um, is actually for Mr. Tom that will talk about the current and recent locations of the portable noise monitors. A bit of an issue here at the moment with the slow network connection. So give me just a moment. And um, so on item one, we did not need to update anything, but that was just if we wanted to update. Yes. So item one was just to, to review and update, and if there was any concerns or questions. Okay. Do you need Ms. Montes to put it on her screen? No, I have a presentation. I just need to uh, a different presentation. Well, it's the old one. It's well, I mean, she's got that. I have a newer, newer version. Oh, of that with okay. The other I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sure. Okay. Uh, no, no, no problem at all. Uh, let's see. All right. So, um, as this reconnects us, yes, I will. So, what you have in your packets is last time's presentation from October a year ago. We are, <clears throat> I updated the figures in it so that we could have. Uh, <laughs> um, so I did update the figures in it and brought some uh, new info for us. So there we go. And uh, so we get the drop on and come in there. Recording in progress. Thank you. Okay, uh, we can go now. This keep going. Thank you. So the. Uh, <clears throat> Information I have basically is the original six months plus the uh, new uh, six months from uh, four months. So it's 12 months total. Uh, what I have the uh, agenda that we have, we're discussing the same as last time, uh, reviewing the current assignments. Okay. That an issue is even more point here. Okay. 
Okay. Um, so again, reviewing the current assignments from the uh, noise monitoring subcommittee, which are Pacific of Palo Alto um, and East Palo Alto, the uh, the Palo Alto East Palo Alto Mental Park monitor is one that uh, was pick one of those. I actually asked all three of the cities if they were interested in um, deciding on who wanted to. Um, Palo Alto volunteered since they had one that was very close to the border of all three. They were willing to go. And then we had um, uh, East Palo Alto come out ahead. And uh, I was able to get a, a hold of one of the city staff members and find a site there. So that was the benefit of that one. Um, what we're looking at right here is all of our current noise monitors. The uh, lower numbered sites, one through 29, uh, from Redwood City all the way up to the tip of San Francisco, are our permanent sites meaning that their board foundation have hardwired electrical, most of them, and uh, communication lines. The uh, next series that we have are the 900 and above series. So for example, if you look here in, uh, let's see where we're going, Brisbane. Getting the Beautiful magical laser that I'm expecting. All right. So, um, right up here in Brisbane, you see 966 and 1001. 966 has uh, been numbered 1010 before and is uh, originally 966, same location. We had to do the numbering. You'll see uh, 1013 down here in Pacifica on the coast. And then if you slide down towards uh, the Dumbarton Bridge, 84 there on the bay, you'll see East Palo Alto, Palo Alto, and then working back west again, you'll see, um, see 978 in Portola Valley and 969 in Woodside. Um, those last ones, the uh, 969 and 978, and also the Brisbane locations, are very old locations. Um, and uh, we are looking to possibly sunset those. Um, just a rehash on the uh, noise monitoring subcommittee, it was originally formed in May 2020. Um, we had committed up to four portable noise monitors for use in the recommended noise monitor locations for current reason. And uh, the noise monitoring subcommittees recommend uh, monitoring location <laughs> at its discretion. And uh, would assist the noise office with contact information <laughs> recommended locations, um, seeing as how the cities typically know their. Areas better than we do, but um, uh, we will definitely be involved with that because we do have some requirements that are involved with that. And then it will review the data uh, provided by the noise office. The uh, reports are put up quarterly uh, in the uh, website that we have. Uh, here's the first one that we had from the committee was. <laughs> It's up at the uh, Fassler water tank, and it is a nice location. It's fairly quiet. Um, it uh, captures both the uh, candle from Oakland and the stick as co departures, and also some oceanics uh, as they come out the airport <laughs> or into the airport. Approximately 3.5 miles outside the 65 dB CNEL noise exposure map. And that is uh, a good location. You can see that red X over here off the coast. There we are. Right about here is where it's located. 
and um, make sure it's a little bit beyond. It does pick up uh, some of the backlog storage as well on departures. Um, I know G hates that term. Uh, departure noise from behind the airplanes. If that works better, <laughs> we can go with that. The uh, East Palo Alto site, uh, just so you can see it's over here. Uh, there we go. Um, it's right over here inland from the uh, Palo Alto site, uh, right under the blue line you can see on the screen there. And it is a, uh, not one of our best locations for capturing SFO noise. Uh, it does great for, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, Palo Alto Airport. Um, it is a very noisy site even though we are on the rooftop of City Hall there. Um, and um, uh, we capture a lot of things there, uh, other than airports, best to explain it just a little bit. The uh, Bodega and Surfer arrivals are captured on this one. As you can see with the blue line, we're missing a Surfer arrival coming up from below that white uh, legend screen there, but that would be where it would arrive from. Approximately 11.4 miles outside the 65 feet. That's as far as we've had Rick, can you remind me what you put that there? Sorry? What was the date that you put uh, Those were all put there. Mm -hmm. Wait. Ish. Yeah. Um, and we did it late in 2020. Um, I have a question, just a clarifying question. The map, it looks like the, the marker shows it for Palo Alto. And not East Palo Alto? We'll show you a better one. Okay. The, this is a reference map that we put on the report. So, okay. yes. so yeah, I probably should change these out for next time. No, I will. Uh, so, Palo Alto, uh, yes, you're right. Same location, one to the other. Um, the Palo Alto location, winner 1 6, is in a private residence um, uh, near the Eleanor Party Park. One of the benefits of it, it is almost exactly under the um, side by waypoint on the uh, arrivals coming in uh, that the surfer feeds into. Surfer does end at Eddy, which is quite a ways back, but um, this is the uh, waypoint where they come off and then start going out to find uh, approximately 10.5 miles. In outside the 65. You can see here better uh, the pins that are on the screen. Uh, right here, here's East Palo Alto, here's Palo Alto, there's side by, uh, and here's Pacifica. Showing the three sides that the uh, subcommittee is asked that we monitor. I'll pause here for a minute to see if there are any questions. I, I do have a question for you, Bert. Yes, sir. Um, at the current locations, you gave how many miles out they were, but what does that translate to their um, DB level for their contour? We'll be getting there. Okay, thank you. So we move on. And here we are to answer your question. So uh, as we look at these, we're looking at uh, the aircraft CNEL, community CNEL, and their total. Uh, you can see that the aircraft CNEL is in Pacifica, the lowest of the uh, three lines. The green line sits smack on top of the community CNEL. And the reason for that is the uh, noise level is uh, highest there, and uh, your total won't go above your highest typically. And so uh, we're looking at for the, all the periods monitored, uh, aircraft noise levels, the median was 37 decibels, far below 65. When we look at East Palo Alto, again, similar thing, but you can actually see the uh, dark blue pop out uh, around July of 2022. 
And um, that's about when they all merged at that point. And then the uh, aircraft noise level separated again. Now. And it was a medium of 50 for the period on aircraft noise levels. Uh, dropping down to Palo Alto, which is the most uh, gymnastic of the uh, contour lines, I guess you could say. Um, the uh, community and the aircraft uh, CNLs did join up a couple times and then uh, went back to the total at the top and then came back to the aircraft. It, it's been interesting to say the least. And um, it's a 49.5 decibel. Okay. Mr. Finnell, just as a reminder to the, the public, just what the community CNL is. The sure. Effects. Community CNL is, um, if anybody can hear the background noises going on, but it would be leaf blowers, cars, motorcycles, et cetera, et cetera. All, all the things that are non airplane um, and non uh, ambient. Ambient would be just if you're able to go to a location and not have anything man made making noise and just stand there and be quiet, that would be an ambient noise. Thank you. Just as an FYI, I'm looking over there because I am color deficient. Uh, and I don't see any color differences. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. All right. Uh, uh, on the screen, I can force my brain to sort of see some color differences. Okay. Well, typically the light green, which is the total, is top. The uh, middle, the top and middle graphs you see there on the screen, uh, the teal is uh, below that. And the uh, dark blue is under that light green at the top on those two. The bottom one, you can actually see three separate lines quite easily. And green is at the top. The dark blue is the uh, community noise level, and it bounces all over the place. It does join up with the uh, uh, total line at the top there uh, for the two measurements in the uh, much going on the screen here is tomorrow uh, numbers would have been uh, December 2022 and January 2023 uh, is where they joined up again and then the teal line is typically at the bottom for your information which is their graphics. Mr. Fernando, I have a question. Um, so with the total CNL, um, looking at the Aircraft CNL and community CNL, are any of those single events or is that they're all It's all single. Yes. Now, if you want to, we can open up individual reports and pull out those. Uh, we have SELs, we have dailies, we have quite a bit of information in the individual reports. To you. Okay. So, Forgive me, but when we look at the data this way, we are sort of trivializing how much noise the airplanes add because it's all an average. And you say, well, it's usually this, and the airplanes add a little bit, so this is what your average is all the time. But most of the ambient or community noise is not highly fluctuating. It's more of a consistent thing than when we have single event planes coming over, which is what our constituents, constituents hear and what cause the sudden bursts of noise that are so disturbing. So, you know, it's hard to get an idea from looking at these kind of numbers singly um, to say it, it looks like planes are very and they're just another little piece of it instead of a larger piece of the single events. Location dependent, I would say, uh, in rebuttal to you. Uh, for example, Pacifica, uh, by the Basler Water Tank. Most of the events are fairly low, aircraft events. Um, the community events, uh, since it's a canyon, at the top of the canyon there, looking towards the ocean on the backside. 
you hear lots of the residents' cars, dogs barking, things like that. And then you just barely even have it in the area today. Um, and the hill getting up there, the cars climbing that hill, some of them are working pretty hard. That would be noisy. So um, it's one of those things when you look at the noise events. In reality, what drives it is nighttime. It's daytime, it's just all sort of a blur of mismatch of noise. And when you get to the nighttime noise, that's when you're going to be able to pick out the interesting ones um, easier because there's less community noise to do that, particularly for aircraft. Um, and as I said, it's quite a way to Most of the uh, events sort of have very uh, fairly low. Uh, during daytime, you might get some. Uh, I remember uh, sitting there with the headphones on trying to pick them out. Um, we actually heard a few uh, Travis airport arrivals for the Air Force Base out near Davis uh, coming in, and they were fairly high altitude. 25,000 feet. But we heard them. Do we hear them loudly? No, we heard them. So um, that's really the, what you're seeing. Now, Palo Alto, I mean, you can see where we're getting some real spikes and bounces and stuff like that. That's where we're getting uh, much better aircraft noise levels in the uh, community. And then we found too, when you start looking at the anemone data that we converted the reports to, they were getting better information. Really finds more interesting. So, I mean, in, in our particular situation, because the bull um, of Brisbane, we get at night, I can hear certainly an individual train going by, you know, that's um, a mile away from my home. And I can hear, but it gets really still where you can barely hear 101 late at night. But I can also hear the ramp up of the engines when they're getting ready to take off, depending on what way the wind's blowing um, and what way the sound's traveling. And that gets, you know, it gives me a little taste of what um, Ann Schneider talks about in in um, in Milbray, right. of, you know, where you hear the, the planes ramping up and it's like, okay, just keep and, and then they take off, and it's like, oh, yeah, thanks for doing that. Um, so it, it's interesting when you say, because we're looking at equivalents, and equivalent during the day is nowhere near what the impact is of an equivalent at night Thank you. or the signal events. I can hear from my bedroom window when someone is having a loud conversation at the bar four blocks down the street. You know, and the kids are playing basketball a mile away um, from where public courts are. And late at night, you can hear every word like you're standing right next to them listening to the conversation. <laughs> I agree. No secrets in Brisbane. <laughs> <laughs> just based on what you shared, Mr. Banan, just about uh, how much noise can be captured based on the location, would it make sense to move the location of the monitor? So that you'd have more aircraft noise to capture and less community signal. It really depends. Um, so, like for East Palo Alto, is the one I'd probably put first to move. I would try to get it more uh, under the approach path. Menlo Park, be a better look area. I uh, was wondering about perhaps um, as just me. Tossing things around, but maybe reach out to Meta, see if they have um, a program they want, might want to join forces on. I don't know. Um, it, it may be too much exposure. <laughs> Who knows? But I don't have any contacts that I need to help um, to see if they'd even be interested in playing or giving us a little bit of real estate to monitor. Um, I know we've monitored a uh, Private residents in Menlo Park during the GMAS approaches. And um, it was all right. Uh, but I will say during the commute hours, wow, uh, I was amazed. We could hear 101 or uh, the, the main drag there is right next to Meta. Um, wow, it was a lot of noise, a lot of noise. But um, uh, Pacifica, 
I think that one's kind of run its course. We know what the general noise levels are at that site. Uh, if they wish to, uh, if you wish to uh, recommend another site in the Pacifica, then we can try that. Uh, but I think this one's proven to us it's pretty quiet um, as far as aircraft noise. Uh, the uh, Palo Alto one, we are going to keep because it's one of the ones that we will be using for GBAS. And but we'll just come and go on that one. And so, uh, if you wish to um, recommend uh, terminating Pacific and East Palo Alto in favor of two or three additional sites, work that out. So, how long have we been getting the anemic data from these portable sites? That has been going on, I think. Or, well, the new CNEL we had that year, so it's been two years. And those, those, that data is available. Aneem is not available in ANOMS. It's what's called a shadow table. So we have to contact our vendor to help get that data that we need to do report on to query. So we have queries all set up to do things like that. We just need access to it in the time period that. Okay, so my concern is if we're moving or sunsetting some of the uh, monitors to a different location mm -hmm. before we have published data, not in shadow schedules. Um, it's published, all those published in the reports. Okay. And so that we have more single event information or just blanket information. Let's do this. Let's get from that for a moment. I will. Because are we going to be getting more anemic data that is generally available without having to pull special reports? No, for quite a while. They can't put a NEEM and NPD both in our system at the same time. One of them has to reside as a shadow data. And because of FAA regulations? No, no not at all. Just limitations be, of the system. So maybe that's something that needs to come back to the round table if the NEEM data would be more uh, beneficial than the CNEL data. And well, that would be the data we would need to rely on. Well, we use CDL for both. Uh, but you're talking about NPD data, which is the way we do the notice of track matching. It's threshold based, which is the state of California need for us to do for our noise contours. And so we have to do that for at a minimum of the 12 sites that we have for verifying our contour at the time. And we do a quarterly report through the county to Turn over to the state. And that's, um, so we're keeping legal by doing that. So we have to keep that option as we the, have to keep running. That's yeah. why it's a priority. That's why it's a priority. So it's not a matter of either or because we have to have the either. Correct. Well, sorry, can, you can you do half and half? Like keep your. I asked. Yeah. No, no so they you, said it's so if you switch to a has to be homogeneous throughout all the monitors, including well, the data we do report all both sets of data in our directory. You've seen it, yeah, for NPD and CNA. Saying, I think what um, Member O'Connell was trying to say was that maybe we need the need in the portables, never mind the shadow table. Yes, so you would like to see that, yeah. okay, right? If your system. Can allow for that. But you were saying that you can't have it run both data on your system. I'll re ask my question. Can you do half and half, meaning half monitors on the old and the other half on the new? Well, I'll tell you what, let's do. I'm not sure what I'm trying to get out of this. <laughs> okay, just a moment. Let me pull the. 
Portola Valley second quarter room. None of us have a horse in that race. <laughs> Is that you sure? One sure. I mean, if you prefer, I can do another. Yes, please. For another? Yes, to, to do it, to one where we do have a horse. Which one? One of oh. me. I, I don't care. We can give your city. We're well, talking out. about Let's those see. three. Oh, you're, okay. We'll do one of those three. Sure. I mean, I'm willing to go to any one you want. Yeah. Right. See what see what the difference would be. Yes. There we go. We have a difference. And we real data. So, you can see here, we're looking at, would you like me to enlarge it a bit? Yes, please. <laughs> that work? Yes. Good. So, you can see here, we have our NPD numbers in the blue. We have the uh, average, the CNEL non aircraft for community, and the uh, CNEL aircraft notes. We also have in the green our mean aircraft. And you can see as you slide down, we're looking at single event, we're looking at LMAX, um, average daily S bundle steps. And that's my opinion, where we start to see real differences, the average number of events. Some of these sites were able to see uh, a decrease in the CNEO from NPD to um, <clears throat> an E, and the noise events went up. And we figured that uh, an E's better at uh, matching. But in this particular one, we look at the SFO aircraft. Uh, here, we see 166 attributed under NPD, and we see 212 under ANIM. The average SEL under NPD was slightly higher, 72. 71 under ANIM. We look at the average LMAX, we're looking at 60 under NPD, 58 at ANIM. And that's one reason why the numbers go up, because it has uh, the lower numbers going below, uh, I would say 50, 60. That we start seeing numbers down in those areas, 55 actually, uh, is where we saw it based on uh, and above counts we were looking at in the newer directors reports. Um, we also have numbers from non SFO aircraft, so Palo Alto Airport, uh, San Jose when they're reverse course, things like that. And then the community noise over here. Um, Anim doesn't do uh, community noise. That's the reason why we don't have a comparison there. And the reason for that is you need a flight track with a model of aircraft noise like that. I mean, I guess if we had a, a steel chainsaw model, whatever, we could do the community noise level on that if we were near something like that. But there's just too many community events to be able to say. Something like that and have a model on it. Um, when you start looking at the uh, community noise equivalent level and the average sound exposure levels, that's where we start seeing. And then for those color challenge people on this chart, the green is on the left. Dark blue is in the middle, light blue is on the right. Green again is an E. NPD is dark blue, and light blue is NPD community.
I mean, the uh, location is a pretty quiet location. There is a school nearby. So I'm thinking that these events were school days where you know things were going on. But in general, it's pretty quiet. All the way across. Then when we go down to there we go. Looking at the uh, events by time of day, which I think is kind of where you were headed. So this kind of was the uh, nighttime, things like that, where the uh, bigger events happen and are problematic, of course. And so this table allows one to pull out. Most of the events obviously happen daytime, evening. We have a higher number of nights because we have fewer events than 10, 50, 7 a.m. But, you know, it's the way the uh, general operations are here. Um, going further into the report, noise events by hour of the day. Um, you can see, like I mentioned, very few events here in the uh, wee hours of the day. Um, and by that, I mean 12 a.m. to say 5 a.m. And then we take off like a racehorse for the day. Um, again, by airport, SFO obviously that site would be the lead Palo Alto Airport and St. Carlos Airport from behind. And then uh, we have SFO events by altitude. Most of them occur in the 4,000 foot range. That's one of the reasons why we're working with GVAS. Hopefully we can have a little bit higher approaches and uh, bump that up. Every 100,000 feet, you lose approximately three decibels. Um, percentage of the aircraft types, well, as we figured, Cessna 150s to 180s. So these are all landings? Uh, most of these processes are closed circuit traffic for uh, practicing landings, yes. Student pilots do lots around and around. And then uh, here's where you can look at uh, departures versus arrivals comparisons for NE versus NPD. And then over here, uh, we've overlaid on the green and neem and dark blue in the table the number of noise reports. Um, a lot of people are fairly uh, certain that the number of events will match the number of noise reports. And I can assure you in my 25 years here, rarely do they match up. And this uh, event day here on the 30th was just one that uh, you can't explain it by the uh, operations numbers um, based on what you're seeing. And then, obviously, noise reporters on the left table. Here's the scattering of the reporters. And the uh, monitor location. Where the arrow is. And that's a picture of the noise monitor. Uh, the rest of it, I believe, is gloss. Yes. Any other questions? In the chance, oh, you want me? Oh, you have a question. Yes. Um, Mr. Ganong, this report, along with probably hundreds of other reports, is on the SFO website. They are here. I'll show you. Thank you. That's <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, if you go to our web page, noise.ysfo.com, um, you'll be brought to the Aircraft Noise Office web page. This is a drop down, so I need to back up one. There we are. You're at the SFO Aircraft Noise Office here. To get to the reports, all you have to do is go to Data and Reports. Once you see that, go to Publish Reports, Reports Archive, click. And then if you're looking, depending on what you're looking for, they're by tab. So you can do Title 21 reports, apply quiets, 
Uh, the airport directors report, which which are the monthlies, and the aircraft monitoring reports, which are quarterly. For the aircraft monitoring reports, look at that. And then you can sort by year, city, whichever, and then download the report. Um, you will also find at the bottom, there are numerical page numbers, or you can click next. I like the over to scroll through them all. <laughs> but this is the new one. Can I ask the following? Yes. Um, for looking at this screen, two from the bottom, the ad hoc noise monitoring report from San Mateo. Mm -hmm. um, with how did this come to be? Was this an individual? An individual called the noise office. Yes. We still do the ad hoc stuff. That's why when I saw ad hoc on your title for the event today, I was like, well, <laughs> different news <position. laughs> issue. Through the chair. Yes. As a reminder, we have there's 10 portables. No. Eight. Eight, eight. Sorry, eight for our sort of review the committee and four were for the uh, service. Uh, well, my office runs for the or for available to committee. Committee and the other four are at discretion of the noise office. Four and four, yes. Oh. That the four that Ms. Woolens referring to, those are the permanent ones. Uh, we have what we call permanent portables. Brisbane's on the permanent portable list, Woodside and Portola Valley. Um, those are ones we're looking to sunset again because we've had years and years of data on it and really changed. But those are not counted in the reporting. Sorry? Right? Those are not counted in the They are. They are part of the daily. Wouldn't have to do all we do without eight monitors. Which which are the permanents that you want to sunset? Uh, we're interested in possibly sunsetting one or two of the Brisbane's, a Woodside and a Portola. Uh, those three sets, I would call them. Um, we satisfy the Woodside over crossing altitude. It is a pretty set with the uh, higher the right. Um, so, and also the noise report. Out that area a little bit. Uh, Portola is um, set. It is originally popped up after the Metroplex in 2015, 2016. And so um, that's one that we are finding pretty flat line as far as most of us. And Mr. Um, the, uh, the ones that are sunsetting, is it three or four? That... Well, I mean, you can ideally sunset um, four sites, two in Brisbane, uh, one or two in Brisbane, I should say. And then um, Portola Valley Woodside, and then, and those ones we've had for ages before the have been around. So that's ones we would like to go ahead and park unless we have a reason to continue. Um, and then we have three assignments from these, this committee, which are Pacifica, uh, East Palo Alto and Palo Alto. I think Palo Alto should remain. We're, well, actually, we're going to keep it, the uh, GBAS. We just wouldn't do it as often. And then the uh, uh, East Palo Alto. Is one that probably should be relocated. I'm just going to express my concern with removing both permanent portables in Brisbane. I think that it is relevant when we see changes that are happening, um, and some of it is cyclical, where uh, for a while they're making really terrible turns and coming right over Brisbane. They're trying to do the, the uh, night hush up the bay and they're doing it terribly and we are really getting bombed with it. 
then it also is going to be an issue further down the road in our planning for the Baylands, where that has been sort of a wide open gate where planes can make the turn between San Francisco and, and Brisbane because it's a lower populated area. Well, it has no housing and that is slated to change. Um, but it also makes a difference what our upper neighborhoods at the ridge get noise wise, where they go through in that in that section. And so um, I would really want to at least keep one of the permanent portables because we are one of the most affected departure cities on the, in the Bay Area and from the SFO predominantly. We get a little bit of Oakland traffic, but you know, I can watch them. They don't fly over us. I watch you guys and it's like coming straight at me. Um, and, and they're low and they're late and everything is late lately. You know, I don't know what's going on with the airports, uh, the airlines, but stuff's taking off an hour and a half, two and a half hours late. They're supposed to leave at 1159, which I think is a ploy to be gone before midnight. And they're leaving at 132 in the morning last night. That happened a dozen times, at least. Um, you know, and I just sit there and go, oh, God, it's coming again. And you can just watch it. Like you so besides hearing the ramp up noise and all the other noise, I think we're really impacted city. And I think that we do deserve to have at least one of our portables for me. Okay. Permanent portables. Um, well, when we had to move site seven up by the water tank where it is now, we brought forth to the city two locations that we were proposing um, and asked what they were interested in. One, both, none. Um, we received no reply back. So we selected water tank, which is as close as we can do to what we have for our Kings Road. And so. Uh, My, our staff didn't give a reply back. You just presented the city council. <laughs> okay. Okay. I mean, I've been on the council 16 years. So uh, it, it, it was maybe about there, but yeah, it's been a long time. I was going to say, uh, no, you haven't. <laughs> I can assure you I have. But, but if it was 16 years ago or more, I could say that maybe it, it wasn't. I mean, but it was presented. Well, I was rather surprised. I mean, I thought when we offered uh, two locations, it would have been, oh, sure. Or, okay, uh, of those two lower valley locations, maybe this one versus that one. But yeah, we came in with a whole proposal of PowerPoint. Okay, well. Oh, I'm, I'm supportive of member uh, recommendation to at least keep one of portable. Portable monitor, permanent monitors in this thing. Okay, which one would you prefer to be? Can I get back to you on that? Yes, sir. Because they're just according to the map, they don't look like they're too far apart. They are pretty close. Um, they may have two sites there. One's called Mission Blue, which is at the Mission Blue Community Center near the pool. And then we have one up at the end of uh, five different rows. Uh, it's off King, it keeps going to the end, and there's a vista there where you can look up. Um, that one is the uh, one I would probably like. It's, really, it's closer to the water tank type. So I, it's up high, yeah. To me, there's that difference. But what I recommend you doing, looking back through time at the uh, noise monitor reports for Brisbane, you will see both sites in each report, and you can decide what you want. But we have to keep the water tank because that's uh, a title to me. No, um, we poured a foundation for that one. <laughs> it would be, I mean, if you want us to take it out. Okay. We don't have a title 20. No. Can you show us on the map which one are title 21?
of this okay that is not not 900 plus yes. oh, okay oh yeah let's just, no. let's just go into email so ANAMS is the tool my noise office uses to um, do flight tracks, noise calculate. It's yeah. the data pool for it. And so I'll fire up ANAMS and show you where we can zoom in, zoom out, move around, and have a good look. Uh, so it's busy loading at the moment. And the So, I was trying to use a mural. Oh, it's hot spot. Oh, my AT&T. Oh, the SMC problem. Yeah, that was the one that uh, my system said it was too slow to handle a network connection back to my office. So. This room is really bad. Oh. Yeah. Need to put an extender in here. Can I take a recommendation from the second? <laughs> <laughs> we can agree on that. Yeah, we can all recommend it. Uh, whether that happens. Yeah. All right. So, go back to the chair. So I guess I should ask Tim if he had any questions on our input on what we've talked about so far through the chair of Yes, please. And then after that, we have to need to do public comment. Yes. Definitely. There we go. I don't have any additional info or anything right now, Bert, unless you had a kind of specific question for me. Everything so far has made a lot of sense. That's what I'm hoping to hear. Thank you. Mm-hmm. So what you see on the screen right now is obviously a map, airport depicted. Um, we have our noise monitoring site, permanent noise monitoring sites up right now. What I'm going to do is go ahead and start lighting up our portables. So if I remember correctly, we have uh, one zero. Zero one for Trinity. That's the road I was looking for. Okay. And the one zero one zero or so those would be the three sites we have um, in our uh, city in your city of Brisbane. You can see that the uh, Trinity Road is 1001. It's quite close to the water tank site, it's seven. And then the other one out here was sort of Ridge Line, where the development happened later. It used to be uh, a nice slot in the past for a long time. Uh, so those are the When they find water, is it when or where? When? When? Oh, it's been ongoing for twenty plus years. Oh, okay. Uh, and then, the but now the state's forcing us to put housing yes. on our dump. So thank you, BC. <laughs> <laughs> So, Mr. Gadog, so uh, the Title 21 um, sites, um, and if you want, you could just tell me which, because uh, I have the map in front of me. All right. So, best to use this map to look at it okay. and understand this way. 
So you've all seen the noise. Yes. It goes out to the west, a little bit behind the airport, down towards Foster City, and then obviously the large Flying Jesus. Out of the bay. Well, we call it upside down. <laughs> but wow. uh, <laughs> yeah. So one, four, six, 18, 19, five, 22, uh, slightly eight, but it's not good. And uh, we have. And then uh, 29 and 12. To the, the, the key sites are verifying endpoints of the noise capture. So obviously nothing over the bay. We have 12. Eight should be a good one, but obviously it's not. We have to find a new home for that. And then oh, six or 18 right now, that the way the contour is going. And those would be the three closure points, which is the term I'm entitled to call it. Thank you. Yes, sir. Can I get the to go back? So we're definitely going to keep um, the permit monitoring to list the bank with the location to be determined. Um, I am in support of moving the monitor from East Palo Alto to Menlo Park. And for a line, I can give you the contact for Meta. Okay. And, and then I just, I wanted to find out and let you know if this is an offline conversation. And, and that is, with the community, <clears throat> noise level being the way that it is at the location and captured information in Menlo Park previously, is there an analysis that can be done just on the community-based organization that a city can do itself? And they use your data to find out more information about the noise levels, where the noise is coming from. Oh, we have to share okay. the information. Uh, keep in mind, microphones are non-directional. It's a single microphone. Okay. Non-directional would be up. Okay. So, I mean, to be able to say, oh, it's coming from over there versus over here, which freeway? Which roadway? Okay. We couldn't do that. Okay. Now, unless uh, they were able to say, okay, the one on one traffic levels increased to whatever by this time, and the other two were relatively quiet, yeah, you can pull it off that way. And so, in working with whomever we would work with, we'd be happy to share just the raw data and they could go where they wish. So, with this, the sunsetting or possible removal of the uh, permanent temporary monitors. Mm -hmm. Where is it that you feel the need for them to go? And what are we going to do with the excess? Are part of these going to be going to the chi bass? The, the Definitely be used. Permanent, permanent. For the chi bass. Not permanent, permanent G bass, but we have uh, some sites that we would like to visit there. We've been there before. Um, it's also going to be resident dependent. That's why we prefer to go in public lands if we can. Uh, much easier. And uh, also, too, with the new uh, agreement for portable noise mining, that we're going to have to ask people to sign if they drop off the monitor. That may be a bit of hard work for them because you're basically acknowledging you have a fifteen thousand dollar piece of equipment and it's your responsibility to make sure it doesn't get damaged. Now, yes, we understand if deer walk through your property and sever a cable and we have to replace it at six hundred dollars. So, okay, that happens. But if you decided to have a party and moved everything into the storage closet. They got damaged in doing that, or somebody stole it, even though we chained it down. Okay, then there may be a problem. Has GBAS uh, requested a certain number of monitors? We have determined that we are going to try to go back to three or four locations of the six that we had before. Okay. 
So you're going to need out of the temporaries, you're going to need four directly for GBAS. Mm -hmm. And we're hoping to work amongst our uh, sites that we have right now to leapfrog and make sure that we are able to do it. Um, if we're doing two weeks per quarter on a permanent portable site, whether it be yours or our old ones, we off time to do broad monitors. Um, there are some times we need to monitor to sit there in our shop quiet and then go out in the field for months. And so that's where we reserve for our ad hocs and things like that as we get those. So, yes. So does that mean that if you have a um, monitoring in um, Brisbane, for example, mm -hmm. um, the two weeks out of the quarter, that's, let's call it active, mm -hmm. and then you rec record data and translate that into a report. Mm -hmm. The other, uh, how many weeks would that leave in the quarter? Um, Leftover that could go and be placed somewhere else. I, I realize that's a staff time. Staffing, a staffing, a staffing, a staffing that's, that's the big issue right now. We are really short staff. Um, we're actually using our consultant to deploy for us on most of our deployments right now. And that's not cheap. So the constraints are not really the physical equipment, but it's rather the the staff time and moving that to a new location to achieve more more and data and your staff the and then your staff time in creating that report yeah. by taking the data. There's a lot of so you have some kind of limitation on the number of reports. I think that you, you yeah, and I think that's probably data we need to know that how many how many two week I'll reports you need. with management again to find out what the but it was there was your staff. Um, Staffing issues because you are not hiring any more staff or you've got vacant positions. Um, I just budgeted for two additional staff coming up in 24, 25. But, uh, and is this something that GBAS is contributing to your noise office? No. For, no. Wouldn't they have some responsibility of contributing to that budget rather than? Pulling it from the resources that have already been um, allocated to uh, community noise events instead of operational changes. Mm, considering it's an airport purchase item, uh, we support the airport. It's hard to say no. Hard for you to say no, but it might be something we can have big for. Yeah. Because if it's a program that SFO is taking on uh, exclusively for their on time benefits, then one would assume that that would be a different program that pulls resources from oh, our program. Those who don't know at all. Uh, on time. Does mean that airplanes aren't going to be keeping you up late at night, as you mentioned before. Yeah, maybe. Well, I, I, I don't think that they're going to really schedule have less aircraft or less late night aircraft just because no, less they're going to be able to squeeze more in. Delay. No, <laughs> so if you are scheduled out at the same night. And there's been East Coast or West Coast weather delays all day long. Then those flights off time get pushed back into later and later time slots. So we'll fly at nine o'clock, goes out at eleven, midnight one. Um, I know United is famous for doing their West Coast sweeps, where they had tons of operations up and down the West Coast, and we get West Coast flow control things. From air traffic control. And United would have people that couldn't go uh, either direction. So, last flights of the night, they would grab an empty 747 or 777, whatever they needed to get everybody from SFO down to LA and LA back up here. That was their clean sweep for the day. So, 
I mean, we went from using a bunch of smaller ones to two big ones. Yes. Um, as the committee steers towards maybe making a recommendation for just clinical monitors, I'm reminded we had a discussion. I think um, the Mayor Schneider's committee about Brown base noise. Brown base noise. Thank you. Coffee today. Um, about a uh, portable monitor placed on Rollins Road in early game near the new development. I don't know what had happened with that not happening, but that was one. We're not going to do Rollins Road. I'll tell you right now. Okay. It's, it's well, somewhere near, near, near there. In my well, there were four locations we're talking. So, like the Millbrae Community Garden, okay. uh, we scoped out a location, but she hasn't approved it yet. They're up towards the uh, the water tank up the hill, right. uh, the water treatment plant, sort of on the Millbrae San Bruno border. And we're still looking for two locations in uh, the Hillsboro and uh, Burlingame area that uh, would be suitable. I know we were recommended the uh, Hillsboro Corporation Yard. Um, it won't pan out, it's too noisy uh, all day long. And uh, it's in a valley. So I don't really need to get into details of exactly where, but remind how that, that number four of those locations, maybe three, that impacts the discussion. They are around table sites. Right. So those right. Are part so of the map is not computer. That would be our leapfrogging rotation. Yeah. So are we clear about two weeks there two weeks? Yeah. Right. I mean, as the recommendation unfolds, is there clarity? We will have to one, one assume, pencil it in. One portable that's doing a quarterly rotation should be able to handle four sites, correct? In theory, yes, if you have them going one to the next to the next to the next. Now, if you have one such as the dual at Brisbane, you would want two to have simultaneous noise. Um, one of your residents is requesting a response from me, and I'm almost finished with it. I might be able to get it out today, actually. But uh, the issue with that one was he's, they've done matching up. Nothing's right. We're talking apples and oranges. His deployment schedule got messed up, and they had to get a new monitor from us. So they're off. One went out two weeks here. The other one went out two weeks here. So to be so able to not do seeing the same he's not one. seeing a direct comparison. Okay, so I see. So you would need four, but only for a quarter of the time. Yeah. And then two weeks. Ago. Yeah, uh, that quarter. So ideally, what we want to do is have them all done at the same time. And so um, it's possible we may end up needing two more. And we would steal from our shop to do that. So, I mean, it, Goes one way, it goes the other. With way. the G pass, are you going to have that same issue where you're going to have one, all four of them deployed at during the same time, so you see yes. how a single event tracks in That's exactly what you want to see, guy. So, with regard to what Linda brought up, which was the the, the four the portables that are required requested from um, the Schneider's committee. The noise up the hill, we call it, and where they're going to place them up the hill to see how the battle bus actually travels. Um, that the assumption there was that this is such a two week recording period, and of course, they would borrow them from a site somewhere, bring them to these four places, and then put them back. So it would not, in in our estimation, affect a, a, a need for this committee to make any decisions because they're not, they're going right back to where they did it before, wherever that. Is you decide, change or whatever, but it's just borrowing from temporary. So I don't think that's anything that's helpful. So again, with the three, I think we've sort of decided on three that we're retiring, or that's under consideration. Well, I have two. One, one potential in Brisbane yet to be determined which. 
uh, you spell it off to move the middle part, so that it was the middle. And then, well, we were talking about Pacific as well. Yeah, yeah. Hang on to that one. Okay. I think the site is demonstrated it's quiet. And you saw a pretty flat line all the way across from COVID all the way up to today, where we have almost returned to our previous numbers. And I think that was one of the things that I was kind of nervous about seeing drop through COVID and then come back. It's really amazing how the site sort of stayed consistent. The request to place and monitor in that comes from this committee, three sides. That that came through Pacifica member, I believe. Uh, Mr. O'Neill. Oh, Mr. O'Neill at the time. No, oh, oh, at the time. It was oh, Mr. O'Neill. Uh, to to parts of your question. Um, one is we're. Our city being contacted ahead of time to let them know that we're looking to relocate the monitor if it's on a public site or even a private site. Uh, this committee is the one that does that. Okay. Um, in and fact, last time none of the cities were aware that they were up for getting one, okay. and so uh, that was where I put the ask out please make sure that this committee talks to them so that. I when I reach out to them, uh, their city staff is not caught flat footed. Because um, what I usually ask for is a place that's relatively quiet, city owned, or some control over it, secure that we can chain a monitor to. And then uh, um, power, if we can, be nice, they don't have to swap batteries. And now, are they already one of the monitors that are in San Francisco? Recording really low, almost no airplane activity. The further away you get from the airport, the lower you get. I mean, the lowest is 28 down in Vegas, further south. But those aren't available to just be moved. No, those are all permanent sites. Also, too, um, when we talked about uh, with the FAA the potential for getting sites further away, they said, no, we can't. And we said, what do you mean? And they said, our purview is to validate your noise contour. So in other words, close into the airport. And when we told them we had 29 noise monitor sites up down the peninsula, they said, uh, yeah, you may not get grandfathered in the application. If there aren't any more questions, I'd like to you know, okay. just, just to clarify. So this committee is looking at providing input and direction regarding the renew well really uh Pacifica, East Palo Alto, and Palo Alto, correct? And Brisbane. Well, Brisbane is a permanent port. Which is the SFO's party, right? We're offering it up. <laughs> yeah, but there's four appointments. Yeah, on the permanent portables. So, so we're you're going to stop them all. You're going to offer them all up. Okay. So, so you want some input from this committee on your permanent portables and how that can fit in with the. Well, either we stop them or they become yours, is the way to put it, right? I see. So if you you're going to stop them, and so if if we want if we want to see them continued, they have to become one of our four. Yes. Ah, thank you for that clarification. Okay. The, the big thing about it is we want to see value from what we're monitoring. I mean, if we go and we just see a flat line, it's okay. Oh, that site's fifty decibels. If we see that there's trends and swings and things like that. And we can pinpoint and go after things like you were talking about. That's where we find value. And that's where we find it's worthwhile. I mean, and, and in that respect, I would say that the monitors that we have um, do show when we can pinpoint what the flights are, where the problems are. And it gives us 
once we start getting better um, flight track information through the Aneem system, where we can say that flight 4545 always at one o'clock in the morning is tipping our scales, we can see if there's some way to look at what air traffic control is doing or the pilots are doing, that we can change what flight 4545 does. Well, that's already through web traffic. It's, it is starting to come through and that's where uh, the people in our uh, group, the, our citizens group, um, are trying to really get some information and try to figure out how we can identify the bad, bad actors and really know that this is a trend and how can we go about dealing with that. And, you know, some of that might be through, you know, SFO, it might be through the airline, it might be through Tracon. Um, and, you know, all those steps are more difficult steps than the last step. Yeah, uh, right now, we're trying to make money on the CEO. Right, right. So, again, it's something that, you know, we need to figure out a way on our own to get some of this information so that we can pinpoint who the bad actors are and how we can coerce them to doing something a little bit better for our residents. Um, well, you know, we're seeing a lot of the night thing. noise for the people trying to do the up the bay and out over the Golden Gate Bridge is they're just not turning fast enough. They're just taking their own sweet time to make their first turn and they're coming off the, uh, not off the 2A. You know, so doing bad shoreline. Well, that was one of the predicaments we found ourselves in most metroplex because all of those are RNAV departures, which is area navigation. And the difference between the old visual and area navigation is the old ones used to, when you were 400 feet into the air, they could turn right. Once they apply the RNAV to it, the RNAV rules apply, which say, okay, we need to get to field elevation plus 500. So that's 11 feet plus five, and they do it in rounded increments of 20. So 520 feet, and all the way to the end of the runway. Then they can turn. So that pushes them out in the community. So we're coming out the door hobbled, is the best way to explain it. And so we're working, trying to find a possibility of a waiver, possibility of any change, anything we can do might fix that. One of the, the fingers that I'm keeping crossed is GBAPs, because eventually they'll be doing departures. Right now it's arrivals only, but eventually that technology will be allowed to do departures. And so putting those eggs in that basket, I think are worthwhile. Be a while, but worth looking at. Thank you. We'll move on to the public comments. Yes, Madam, thank you. We do have one virtual hand raise on Zoom, and that is from Darlene Yapley. Ms. Yapley, go ahead. Bert, for some reason, the slide 14 in the packet, which is the summary of monitoring slide, has different dates than what you presented. It only has 2020 to 2021, and yours went to 2023. So if we could get the updated information, that would be great. I think just to be clear, for non-Title 21 monitors, which is virtually every one of the portables, the desire is to have aneem data, not to have DNL data. And I think that's why it's confusing to understand because we want to know using aneem, the most accurate information, what is N above ambient and LMAX levels. Comparing LMAX levels to SEL is not apples to apples. People want to know the number of events at the loudest sound that they're experiencing. And I also think that we need ambient noise. E East Palo Alto's ambient is 55, Pacifica's 55, Palo Alto's is 48. 
community CNL should not be considered. My understanding is community CNL includes some airplane noise that's left over when the threshold and duration does not capture the event. So really it's ambient noise. And I support moving the East Palo Alto monitor because it, it can't be capturing the events if it's only getting 31 events a day. Um, the decision-making, it, it's a little bit confusing. I heard that we need the monitor in Palo Alto for GBAS. And then the summary said, we need to look at, relook at Pacifica, uh, East Palo Alto, Palo Alto and Brisbane. So is there a decision or is there not a decision or there's a decision later? What decision's being made now for later? This is a little bit confusing. And then what the constraints are, I think originally we were looking at the number of monitors, but then you mentioned that there's resource constraints, which is understandable. But it'd be useful to understand what what is the exact decision making criteria, quantity wise. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Yapley. And with that, Madam Chair, we have no further hand raised for item two. Thank you, Ms. Fontes. Ms. Fontes, I would love to see if there are any other comments, and then also Ms. Um, Wentworth, that there is an opportunity to follow up with the public comment just around this. So we may need to submit it to you on what we're doing. Thank you. I, I, I am too. Um, I just wanted to follow up just with the public comment to clarify the decision making process and what our charge is with the subcommittee um, for the portable noise monitors. As I understand it, the charge is for this committee to um, assess and make recommendations on the place to get the floor round table. Portable noise monitors. Um, and I would add that, um, given Mr. Donald's statement about sense I think the permanent ones, I think that takes into account a broader assessment of, of how that would work and and if and how we want to make input on that that might augment our for or I don't know. So, and for a sunset date, if I may, we're looking for end of year. Just, just year. make it around bigger. This year. Yeah, just something like, unless you guys figure that, hey, we want another year, another six months, whatever. And, and the portable permanents, the permanent portables, mm -hmm. um, probably are not in our purview to make a a decision on, we would be making a recommendation to the full round table on the permanent or the portables. I think we have a little more leadway on making a recommendation now um, to what, where we see a need or have we had a request for those, is that correct? That sounds, sounds good to me. Um, I would just point out that um, with regard to um, our, our four, three of which are in operation apparently, um, we have four in our purview, three of which are currently in operation, Pacifica, East Palo Alto, and um, Pacific, Palo Alto. Yeah. Um, so there's a fourth available slot for us. Well, we're rotating. Brisbane, Portola, we would say, is, is part of that group. We're saving our four typically for the uh, GBAS program, or ad hocs, we get requests for things like that. So, like I said, we okay. sort of so, allocated these as well. Okay, so I, I guess I need to understand then that we have four slots of it. Mm -hmm. And we currently have two, three, four, five, six, seven in operation all together that are going to be put into our bucket to have to find a spot for. I mean, I didn't realize we're now taking away the four permanent portables and that they were. Well, we have an interest in the sunset. So if you would like to continue them, you may. 
that's up to the roundtable. And it's up for the roundtable, but the subcommittee can make a recommendation to the council. So if you want to chair, just yeah. the origin of the subcommittee. Um, the idea was these are all recommendations. I mean, technically, the, the noise office does not have to accept the recommendations, but this was a way to involve the community. So I think the original idea was that this subcommittee would support the noise office by recommending what they thought the community would prefer, and also to help the noise office filter requests to the extent we were just getting more requests than he could accommodate, it would kind of get um, reviewed and vetted by this subcommittee. But to, it's actually a full roundtable. The subcommittee develops subject matter expertise so that the roundtable is fully advising the noise office on what the community might want best. So we make no decisions here. We make recommendations. Yes, which and is, for, is very nice to accommodate. But I think it should... I mean, technically, go through the roundtable, and particularly when there might be a question, like of let's say retiring the Pacifica one, it would. I think it's important that the full roundtable. I'm sure the roundtable will bless the subcommittee's recommendation, but I think it makes sense to support the roundtable, full roundtable in that way. And that's from historical when, when we developed the subcommittee. Can Can I make one one yes. thought that comes to mind? You know, Pacifica is not sitting here today. And um, nor is Woodside or Potomac, nor is Burlingame or Millbury. Right, but you don't have any. Well, yeah. But I mean, so, so I think that perhaps now that we're talking about the permanent ones as well, that the scope of this meeting did not anticipate that maybe we should be more, um, find a way to get additional input on those before we, I mean, I don't see how we can make a recommendation on those without um, that makes sense. That makes sense. And I'm not sure how you even asked this question. I think Bert answered it just about has anybody submitted a formal request. And so far it's just the GVAS subcommittee that's made a request to have one of those. No, oh, the GVAS. Uh, the ground based uh, ground -based, ground -based, ground -based as well. The short list of uh, Citizens. Okay. So, so I would make a recommendation to the entire roundtable that we honor the request for the ground based noise committee to be in the rotation for their noise uh, monitoring. Um, I would uh, make a recommendation that we reach out to the that we discuss it in the round table and and I'm I'm assuming it's not up to us to say yes we're uh, blessing the use of four of the monitors for GBAS because those were already in your purview. Uh if I mean uh, along those lines, but my intent the whole time was to since we offered four for the ground-based noise, take care of that with ours. Okay. And that way, wouldn't interfere with any of the ones currently going in the pool. Also, too, with GBAS, ours, we'll be doing that. Now, if suddenly they decide, hey, we need two more, okay, I might rob from the two that we typically allot to you guys, but I'll be doing the leapfrog game and the shell game and making sure that Everything done, and at the same time, they need to be done. So at this point, you're looking for a us to give a recommendation about either changing the position or retiring one in Brisbane, one in East Palo Alto, and perhaps moving that to Menlo Park, um, and to uh, and and then. One in Woodside and Portola, Portola Valley to be retired, that because they haven't shown any significant noise changes. Yeah. And also, know, we have the history on it. Woodside is becoming much more difficult to monitor. It takes like an hour each way to go up to that monitoring location. And uh, since they're cellular based, 
the devices on. Um, we're having a heck of a time now connecting. So I don't know if they lost the tower out that way or what, but uh, it's becoming more difficult. So those would be what you're asking us to make a recommendation to the round table right. at this point. And any placement of what is removed would come back into our pot for disbursement within the community or you know, possibly finding another site that yeah, it, it was limited to I think one building points we discussed earlier, Kathleen, for you. There was a 16 number and a 34. Yeah. And I don't recall. I need to go back and look at those notes that yeah. we discussed. It, the the generality was four monitors. 34. Per, 34 or reports, per quarter. Uh, four monitors per quarter for you. 16 reports. And so the goal was to do that. And the reason being was static. Um, management almost had a heart attack when I said, in theory, you know, we could be two weeks here, two weeks there, two weeks here. They went, no, 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 we are not geared for that. We can't do it. 132 reports. In theory, yes. <laughs> we just don't have the time to sit there with the headphones on. I'd love to bring you all into our office and show you how to do it, but it's it's not easy. You're sitting there listening to the crickets, and then they go, oh, hey, you know, oh, car. Uh, you know, it's just trying to verify what the system heard. And AI doesn't do that for you. No. We're trying to make it smarter. We really are. We finally taught how to do wind events. That was a big one. Now we're trying to teach it reverse thrust and speed breaks. Um, I think you need to get one of those little whiz kid uh, uh, AI people from Stanford to uh, teach your teach your AI monitoring. monitoring. So just come in support of, of everything Member O'Connell um, just shared as far as a recommendation to the round table. And I'm also in support of Mr. Ganat's recommendation to sunset um, at the end of the year. Um, I remember, uh, this was probably two years ago, I noticed a lot, there's uptick during the summer with mm -hmm. air travel. And so I, I don't want to disrupt that, capturing that data any place, mm -hmm. so. No, we would go definitely to the thirty first. And if the deployment happens, say on the twentieth, and we needed a full fourteen days, we'd roll into the. I mean, we're not going to just go. Nope, oh, done. What's interesting because the December work reports are so convoluted with the storms that roll in that yeah. you know it it makes it you know a, a a world of its own when you have those big storms. And, mm -hmm. You know, traffic's going the wrong direction all night long at the cloud cover so low that it feels like the sky is weird. We're there with you with the headphones on, trust me. As we listen to those events, we're like, oh, it's wind, and all of a sudden we go, oh, wait, wait, no, there's airplane in there. So, but see, it, when you're in the home, you I know. feel the whole home vibrate when it's an airplane. It's like, oh, yeah. that's not the wind. <laughs> Any other items on the agenda that we need to cover? I know we pretty much most of our meeting has been an open discussion. We have we touched on a lot of topics, but just wanted to follow up. I think you can cover everything. Are we up to date on public comment? Yeah, we open for the number of new Then, yeah, then for next steps or recommendations. Okay. And, and I, I hope that. Um, Number number of how we break up the splits, summing up um, what the recommendations are. So just double checking that out and make it repeated. Um, um, sufficient. I would. Look. So the recommendation is going to be to to um. Well, what is what do you recommend for Pacifica? So Pacifica, it was to actually um, follow up with the cities um, to not do anything until we contact. Uh, folks and to, and then let that be a discussion once people are informed. Um, Will we probably recommend this went with contact the Pacific member okay. in between now and the round table meeting? Okay. But we can't you're you're deferring a decision on that one until that contact has been made. Yes. But you still want to 
um, bundle the rest of them to go to around here. Yes. Are you okay with that? I think so. Yeah, I think I am. Um, you know, and I <laughs> perhaps if we make it where we reach out to the affected cities um, about the ones that we propose to sunset um, and then make our recommendation and have the discussion at the round table meeting um, because they've been forewarned and you know they may be able to say well the pacifica monitor perhaps if we could move it to site xyz or you know we've had a lot of pushback you know that they've um, thought about it it might be able to go forward at that time depending on the response from pacifica um, and it might be able to be you know the other two monitors that are proposed to be sunsetted you know, might be able to go forward, they may give a different recommendation and we certainly would discuss it because, you know, just because our recommendation is not accepted doesn't mean there's no new move that could be made. Mm -hmm. And things are continuing to move. If that makes sense. Very much. So we've got Pacific, so we've got, um, Pacifica, Woodside, or Total Valley, which will to be determined for discussion, uh, discussion of the roundtable meeting voting on. Yes. The others are East Palo Alto will be relocated to a better position in the park. Palo Alto is not being sought for um, sunsetting at this time, so it remains. Brisbane is um, possibly sunsetting possibly one. sunsetting one. And I will discuss it with my people. But that's so that's the TBD also. I am not gonna be at the meeting. So um actually well we'll see how quickly the cities will get back to us. And then you can make it happen. Okay. The next meeting. Sure. I'm looking my nephew's uh, uh rehearsal dinner in Portland of so. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, so in the complete consensus, yes. Okay. So, okay, well, um, thank you all for a very fruitful discussion, and uh, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.